Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. And a happy October to you. This is the month where the nights get longer. The stories, they get scarier. And my voice gets even deeper. After all, this does kick off scary season. And I've assembled one hell of a program for your listening enjoyment and or torment you know whichever you're into so to kick off the month of October just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water Adam has come along and ruined it for all of us here's his wild encounter from the state of Florida hey Derek it's Adam from Cape Canaveral, Florida area. I had a story of just listening to your pod and it reminded me of something. Probably 15 years ago, we were in high school, me and my buddy, and we always left early to go uh, cobia fishing off the Cape. And one day we got out uh, about 40 miles offshore and um, probably about three o'clock. We were fishing, we were bottom fishing at the time. And out of nowhere, a gigantic spear, silver mirror, was about three feet below the surface. And it went right under our boat. And it was probably a 20 by 20 circle. Perfectly spear, mirror. You look down in the water, and you could almost see yourself reflect off of it. And then we ran to the other side of the boat, and you could see it there too. And it just went slowly against the current so it wasn't floating with the current it was going into the current and we couldn't even see any type of propeller or anything that would move it it was super weird and we reeled up and booked it out of there pretty strange i mean we got nasa right there but i've never seen nothing like that thanks guys that was my story but thanks adam Now, we've discussed this subject in the past. USOs. Unidentified submerged objects. Or, more simply put, UFOs under the water. Now, full disclosure, although I've spent the past few hours reading up on the subject, I don't feel I know a lot about these strange underwater anomalies. But what I do know is that this sort of phenomenon has been going on for quite some time. Contemporary reports go back to the 1950s, and sightings go as far back as 1492, when Columbus recorded a strange sighting just days before arriving to the New World. I've also learned that there seems to be two main hotspots for this strange activity. Of course, one encompasses parts of the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and yes, even the east coast of Florida. For those that didn't catch it, Adam's encounter took place on the east side of the Sunshine State. The other hot spot, you ask? Well, naturally, it's in my backyard. It seems the Pacific Coast, from Santa Barbara, California, all the way down to San Diego, has been invaded by this mysterious phenomenon. And a hot spot it seems to be. From a supposed USO underwater base off the coast of Point Doom, to the recently declassified UFO videos that were captured by the Navy. 
which were filmed in that general area, about 140 miles southwest of San Diego. It seems the coast of SoCal is abuzz with activity. In fact, one of the pilots that witnessed the infamous UFO, Commander David Fravor, recently shared a story he heard from a helicopter pilot assigned to retrieve data-collecting torpedoes. The following story originally aired on the Joe Rogan Experience back on October 5th of 2019. I, I worked, I, I still do it, but I was doing oil and gas at the time uh, on, a, on a contract, and one of the guys, the story came out, and he was a Navy helicopter pilot. He goes, D- hey, can I talk to you, man? I go, what about, he goes, dude, I got I to talk to you. I said, what do you want to talk to me about? He says, dude, do you know your UFO? He said, yeah, he goes, I had a similar experience. I said, what's that? He said, he was flying uh, CH-53s, which is a big lift, heavy lift that the Marine Corps uses, and the Navy uses it for certain things. And when they go off of, for the East Coast, they do a lot of shooting off of, at the time, it was off of Puerto Rico. We had Roosevelt Roads that they ended up closing. Um, but he was flying out of there. And they have these things that are called BQMs. They fly around, and then when they're all done, because they'll fly towards the ships, and the ship can, they can track with the radar. And then they blow ballast, and this thing will come to the surface and float, and then they go pick them up, and then they can extract all the data out of them. He said the first time they're out and they're going to pick up this BQM. And those things, when they're flying, they're done. A parachute comes out and they got to go. They hook it up. The helo drops the swimmer in the water. He goes and hooks this whole thing up and then they hoist the whole thing up and fly back and then they extract the data. So he says he's going on there and they're getting this thing hooked up. And as he's looking down, you know, because they're, I don't know what, 50 feet above the water, he sees kind of this dark mass coming up from the depths. And they start to hoist the the diver up and he's got they've got the bqm and as they hoist it up he says and he's looking at this thing going what the hell is that and then it just goes back down underwater it just like once they pull the kid and the the bqm out of the water this object descends back into the depths so he thinks well that was pretty weird a few months later he's out and he's picking up a torpedo so he says they hook the diver up on the winch and they're lowering him in and as he's looking down he sees this big massive he goes it's not a submarine he's seen submarines before once you see a submarine you, you can't confuse it with something else this big object, you know, kind of circularly says is coming up from the depths, and he starts screaming to through the intercom system to tell him to pull the diver up, and the diver's like a few feet from the water. So they reverse the winch, and the diver's thinking, "What the hell's going on?" And he's getting pulled up, and all of a sudden, he said the torpedo just got sucked down underwater, and the object just descended back down into the depths, and they never recovered the torpedo. Now you can find the entire interview under episode thirteen sixty one of the Joe Rogan Experience. Now, I played that call because of the similar description of the craft's shape and possibly size to what Adam witnessed. And judging by the activity described in Commander Fravor's story, Adam and his buddy should be thankful they too weren't sucked down into the depths. So thanks again, Adam, for sharing that terrifying tale. Now for this next one, things are about to get hairy. Please welcome David from Massachusetts, back to the program. Hello, Derek, Addy, and friends. My name is David, and the experience I'm about to share with you took place in Weston, Massachusetts, which is located roughly about 15 miles west of Boston. Back in July of 2015, I had just reconnected with a old girlfriend who I hadn't seen since 1986. It was very exciting to be back with her again, and I wanted her to go out with my sister for old time's sake. So one day, after grabbing a bite to eat, the three of us found ourselves driving around the town of Weston, admiring all the beautiful homes with their perfectly landscaped lawns. It's also important to note Weston has hundreds of acres of town forest, which gives the feeling you are up in Maine, New Hampshire, and or Vermont somewhere not just minutes outside of Boston. It was now around 7 p.m., and the nice summer day was starting to turn into a truly gorgeous evening. Driving down Church Street towards the center of town, my sister was busy talking to my ex-girlfriend. As we drove over a small bridge that crosses over an old abandoned railroad that cuts through one of the town's forests, I could not believe my eyes. I immediately interrupted them Did you guys see that? They said, see what? I quickly made a U-turn and parked on the bridge. Looking down off the bridge onto the abandoned tracks about 200 feet west 
was a seven-foot-tall Sasquatch standing there perfectly still, just the same way a deer would, thinking if it doesn't move, you won't see it. It was facing us, and its fur was a dark brown. I couldn't wrap my brain around the idea of seeing a Bigfoot just west of the city of Boston, of all places. No words can describe the feeling of this. This is where it takes an even more bizarre turn. All three of us are still sitting in the car. My sister and my ex-girlfriend don't see it. I'm like, it's right there as I'm pointing at it. Then my sister says, I think I see it, but she's not sure. Meanwhile, my ex-girlfriend doesn't see anything. The total amount of time we were parked there was about maybe two or three minutes. No cars drove past us, and it just stood there, frozen, not moving a muscle. At the risk of totally blowing it with my ex-girlfriend, who I hadn't seen in almost 30 years, I put the car in drive and drove away. Hands down, if I could go back in time and relive only one moment of my life, this would be the one. I should have honked my horn, got out of the car and yelled at it, or throwing a, or throwing a stone in its direction, anything to get a reaction. To this day, I can close my eyes and still see it. There's absolutely no way it was a kid playing a prank. Weston is way too far a boring town for anything like that to happen. Also, it was not a bear. Weston's forests have a lot of deer, coyotes, tur turkeys, etc., but never any bear sightings. Besides, what I saw that evening had a distinct human-looking face to it. In hindsight, the following is the only way I can explain it. I believe in Bigfoot. I saw it plain as day. My sister kind of believes in Bigfoot. She will tell you she thinks she saw something. My ex-girlfriend doesn't believe he exists at all. She didn't see anything. To me, Bigfoot has to have some sort of mystical powers to have this effect on people. How else can you explain three people having three different experiences at the same exact time? Turns out, a couple of months later, my ex and I went our separate ways. I guess the moral of this story is, don't let a long-lost love get in the way of a found Bigfoot. Thanks, Derek and Addy, for everything you do. Monsters Among Us rocks. Thanks, David. Now, I think I might have solved your little mystery. But first, I have to introduce you to this enigma, courtesy of Western Mass News. Search is on for Bigfoot in Brimfield. Todd DeSoto's six-foot-tall Bigfoot statue was stolen from his driveway last night. The incident captured by his home cameras and posted on his Facebook page. Desatel, who is an anthropology professor at UMass, says the statue was a gift. The statue has become the talk of the town of late. Desatel dressing it up to find some humor and social distancing. Well, he says numerous cars stopped by to snap a selfie with it. The professor says he's hoping the robbery is a prank gone bad. I'm hoping by getting the word out, you know, somebody says, oh, we saw him dumped in a field or he's in this woods or something. I don't think whoever took him can possibly sell him because <laughs> everybody's now looking for him. Desitel's Facebook page has been flooded with people sending new slogans to use to post with the statue when it is returned. Hopefully it is. He says he would love nothing more than to wake up tomorrow morning and see him returned undamaged. Now, is it possible that David simply saw a Bigfoot statue? I know it wasn't Todd Desitel's, who, by the way, you may recognize from countless paranormal television programs. But I don't think we could rule out a, another carving or possibly even another stolen than ditched statue. But at a certain point, that almost becomes as far-fetched as a hairy bipedal creature living in the swamps of Massachusetts. But if it wasn't a statue, what was it? Although Bigfoot in Massachusetts seems a bit far-fetched, the state has had its fair share of Sasquatch sightings, especially in and around the Hockamock Swamp region, which shares territory with the infamous Bridgewater Triangle. So with that knowledge in hand, I suppose we should proceed with an open mind. So thanks again, David, for sharing your encounter. If the Bridgewater Triangle is your bag, consider checking out Monsters Among Us Beyond number 37 over on Patreon. A $4 monthly pledge gets you access to that relevant episode and some 40 more. 
Just visit patreon.com and search for Monsters Among Us podcast. Now next up, we venture to the Cornhusker State. The following is Jolene's entry. Hi, Derek. My name is Jolene. I am calling from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I love to listen to the podcast while I'm working, and I really enjoy hearing all the stories. Um, Every time I listen, I have one of my own that comes to mind. So I guess you would describe my experience as like a glitch in the matrix. And it happened about a year ago. I was grocery shopping at my neighborhood store, regular day. I'm walking down an aisle and coming toward me in that same aisle is a woman wearing a hijab, her young son next to her wearing a red shirt and a baby carrier in the front of their cart. So I have to pass them to get through to the end of the aisle. Within five seconds, I get to the end of the aisle and I turn the corner. Walking toward me is the same woman wearing a hijab, her son next to her wearing a red shirt, and the baby carrier in the front of the cart. There is absolutely no physical way that they could have possibly gotten to where they were in that short period of time. Even if they, for some reason, tried to do that, the way that the store was set up, I would have seen them. So it boggled my mind when it happened, and every single time I think of it, I try to come up with a logical conclusion, but I've got nothing. It makes absolutely no sense. I tend to be a skeptic, and I usually believe that about 99.9% of strange occurrences have a rational, scientific explanation, but there is still that 0.1%. Thanks for uh, letting my, me tell my strange little story, and thank you for all of your hard work with the podcast. Thank you, Jolene. It sounds like you had an old-fashioned doppelganger experience. The phenomena in which two or more identical people occupy the same space has been growing in popularity over the past decade or so. Now, back when I started this program, if you would have told me that I'd have a steady stream of doppelganger submissions, I'd probably have scoffed. But here we are, at least two dozen entries and counting later. And if I'm honest, I prefer it this way. I'd rather hear about them than to experience them myself. So thanks again, Jolene, for sharing your encounter. Now up next, we jump ship and voyage east, where Michaela from the UK has a terrifying tale for us. Hi, Derek. This is Michaela from Chichester in the UK. When I was a child, I lived in the county of West Yorkshire, which is in the north of England, and this is where my story is set. I've written it all out so that I don't forget any of the details. Here it is. I must have been about eight years old when we saw them. We were at school playing out in the playground when it happened. There'd always been a rumour about so-called zombies that wandered around the old derelict house in the middle of the field near school. In our minds, however, these monsters were not anything like the traditional idea of zombies, but somewhere nearer to a type of grim reaper or hooded monk. Children in the village would whisper about them walking around in their hooded, black cloaks, chasing the cows and eating them. To be honest, it sounded unlikely to me even then, and I really had no idea what a zombie would look like, even if I met one. However, I was small and it was exciting to continue the tradition of scaring each other to death in the playground at school. Bradshaw, our small village in the heart of the Yorkshire Dales, was rife with mysterious stories of haunted houses and strange happenings. The hillsides were peppered with old, derelict houses and mills, crumbling away into the ground, making exciting and dangerous playgrounds for us to explore. We'd dare each other to go into darkened, wind-whistling rooms and scare each other with tales of dead babies being found half-eaten by werewolves all the while brave, yet terrified. There just so happened to be one of these derelict houses within sight of our school field, and on this particular day, the weather was fair. It was winter, I think, but windy, and we were all chasing around in the playground as usual. Suddenly, one child shouted out above the rest, Zombie! Zombie! I can see a zombie! A huge group of us raced over to where the kid was pointing. There! There it is! Oh, there are three of them! We all followed her eagerly pointing finger across the school field, over the next and into a long field which sloped gradually upwards towards the hill 
where the haunted house was. As I looked, I blinked in disbelief. There, in the middle of the long field, were three black, cloak-clad figures moving slowly behind a herd of cows. The figures were dressed like reapers, each holding a long wooden staff with a hooked end. Their faces were hidden from view under their long, dark hoods. The cows did not seem to be afraid, but wandered unconcerned up the hill as the zombies herded them slowly in the direction of the house. Myself and the other children were just going mad, jumping, shrieking and pointing at the figures. The midday meal supervisors looked very confused and worried as they tried to contain the hysterical mob of children. The one thing that really stuck in my mind was that the adults could not see the figures. I do remember asking if I could go over to the other side of the school field to get a better look. I was sharply told no, and as I was an obedient child, I did as I was told. However, I longed to get closer, to see properly what these creatures were and what their faces looked like. Soon we were all hastily ushered inside, as we were so overexcited and break time was ended early. I reluctantly walked towards my classroom, keeping my eye on the figures all the way back until I got to my class. I was desperate to carry on watching the zombies from the window, but unfortunately we couldn't see into the field properly from the classroom, and as I pressed my nose against the glass, straining to see around corners, I knew I would never forget this day for the rest of my life. I didn't understand what we'd seen, but surely twenty children couldn't be wrong. As I grew up, the events of that day were put firmly to the back of my mind, and it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties that the memory of the zombies would return to haunt me. One Sunday, my friend Diane and I were walking back from my house when she suggested we go to have a cup of tea with her friend Alex. Diane told me that Alex's dad owned the village farm shop. We trooped up the hill to the farm and Diane led us through the farmyard to two small apartments built next to each other at the edge of the long field next to the school where I had attended. Alex's dad had built them for her and her brother so that they could have their own space when they were teenagers. Alex answered the door immediately and led us into the small apartment. While she made us a cup of tea, I rifled through her book collection and spotted the book Maribou Store Nightmares, which I'd always wanted to read. Alex kindly said that I could borrow her copy of the book. As we stood in her kitchen chatting, we gazed out onto the field, talking about nightmares, ghosts and such like. Alex told us that she believed in ghosts and how her dad had always encouraged her to trust her instincts, not stifling her imagination as a child. Looking out of the window, I realised that Alex's flat was built right at the top end of the field, which had played out such a disturbing scene in front of me all those years ago. Feeling slightly embarrassed, I told Alex about the so-called group hallucination my friends and I had had in the school playground describing the figures with their black hooded cloaks and wooden staffs, herding the cows to their death. Without a flinch, Alec looked at me straight in the eye and said, Oh yes, I see them all the time. Talk about a moment where your blood runs cold. I've never forgotten that moment. It's stretched on my memory forever. I don't know what to make of it, and I'd be interested to see what you think, Derek. I've looked into it and there aren't any records that I can find of similar creatures being seen in the local area, but it was so fresh in my mind, and still is, even after all these years. It's a true experience that really happened to me, as I wrote it, and I'd really like to know what you think. Anyway, thanks for sharing my story. Keep up the good work. It's a great podcast. Thanks, Derek. Bye. Thank you, Michaela. Now, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you just described the mirrored men. But nearly every telling detail seems to be missing, save for the trio and the robed appearance. So if not mirrored men, what were they? Is it possible that the farmers in charge of the cattle, dressed up to keep the sun or moisture, or possibly even cold, out? Then, of course, there's the other option that maybe someone out there listening knows exactly what Michaela saw. But until that call comes in, 
I'll just say thanks again for the submission, and please keep your eyes open. If you have some insight on Michaela's call, or you just have a true paranormal experience you'd like to share with the show, call the hotline at 1 888 608 night. That's 1 888 608 6444. And don't forget, if you're out of the States and the call is not free for you, you can always record your story on your mobile device and email me the file. I'm looking forward to hearing all these new entries. Now our next move takes us to the Lone Star State of Texas, where James has a story he'd like to share. Derek, James from Texas. Hey, I'm listening to Season 9, Episode 2, and heard the story about the flash of lightning you were kind of asking about you know would that create some sort of energy that spirit can pull from funny story on that it just kind of reminded me uh, i did a lot of research at the uh, grand teton national park back in 2010 i was one of the lead researchers on a couple of different projects and part of that research was me backpacking through kind of going on back trails doing a lot of forest regeneration looking at stuff that happened, you know, how the forest and the ecosystem was regenerating after the fires that they had in the 80s. Anyway, because of that, I had to camp a couple nights in the back country. And I don't know if you know, but there's all, there's quite a few storms that happen during the summertime in that area. And they're really dangerous because they have a lot of lightning. They have a lot of lightning issues that happen over there. But anyway, I was, I was kind of caught in one of those storms in my tent, and I had a little makeshift porch on the tent with, you know, I made a tarp and stuff so I can sit outside. Anyway, there was a, fla- a big flash of lightning that happened, and I saw afterwards there were four or five, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but there were four or five stationary lights that kind of stayed after that lightning had happened. And they were stationary, but they were kind of waving, kind of like you see what fire does. And that's what originally what I thought is like, oh, crap, you know, this lightning bolt of lightning just started fire and I'm right here. But I kept watching it and it was kind of like a set of a, of a bright light. It was kind of a glow. It's kind of a faded glow, but they were just wiggling. And it was almost like a, like I just want to say it almost like a wisp or something that dancing or whatever you want to call it after this lightning bolt had had struck. Now, the lightning bolt didn't hit the ground or anything, but these four or five kind of mists, I guess you could say, of light were there for maybe 30 seconds after that bolt of lightning. And they're kind of, you know, they were moving around a little bit, but kind of in a circle, almost like you would picture like witches do, you know, they kind of tore around in a circle or whatever. But anyway, after you, you said the story on your episode, it reminded me of that because I've always kind of thought about that. They only lasted for about 30 seconds after a bolt of lightning happened, and it was way back in the back country, so I know it, it wasn't anything human-made. Anyway, man, just wanted to share that story because yours reminded me of it. So, uh, again, thanks for everything. Talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. I love stories from the back country. It makes it easy to rule out human interference and it's almost as if anything out there can be possible. So is it possible that James simply witnessed ball lightning or some other natural phenomenon? Or could it be possible that these lights were spirits, perhaps perished hikers or long deceased Native Americans? Or a third option, could these possibly be the popular ghost light phenomenon that we hear so much about? But I'll tell you what, since it is spooky season, I'm going to offer up a fun, exciting, and not so scientific explanation. Now let's assume for a moment that glowing, hovering craft exist, but we almost never see them. Now that may sound far-fetched, but that's essentially what the Navy has told us over the past couple of years. Now let's say a fleet of these craft are flying through a storm cloaking initiated. Nothing can see them. That is until a heavy lightning strike wreaks havoc on that system, allowing the floating, burning orbs of light to be seen. Then again, 
Maybe I just watch too many movies. Thanks again, James, for the awesome share. Guys, these hoodie pre-orders are flowing in. So make sure you hit up the website at monstersamonguspodcast.com and click on the shop tab. That gnarly print from Cryptid Zoo is also available on t-shirts. So jump over and pre-order today. And don't forget about the totes, mugs, hats, final decals, and much, much more before you check out. All right, hop in, guys. Like the Clampets, we're headed to California, where Selena has a story to scare her socks off. Hi, Derek. My name is Selena, and I'm calling from Woodland, California. So I was around 18 years old in 1993, Finishing up high school, I was living in a trailer on my grandmother's property. One morning at around 3 a.m., I woke up to the sound of an infant crying. There was no one in the vicinity that had an infant. I was in the country with about a half an acre all around me. It sounded like the noise was coming from under the trailer. It lasted about 45 seconds. I know what you're thinking, that it was a cat or an animal or something but I know the sound of a human infant and I know the sound of animals. The reason that it is so scary, the property has a history. My 18 month old cousin was murdered on the property nine years earlier because he wouldn't stop crying. There were other strange incidences on the property, including TVs coming on by themselves, phones ringing with no one on the other end. Needless to say that that was the last time I stayed there. Love the show. My husband and I listen when we're soaking in the hot tub. Thanks, Selena. You're right. I am going to first suggest that the sounds you heard could have been a known animal. Fox, coyote, bobcat. They all especially emit chilling sounds. But as Selena states, she's certain that's not what she heard. I do find it interesting that the sound she heard she immediately pegged as a crying baby. She's right, that's a sound that most people can immediately identify. And I believe that's a trait that's ingrained in our will to survive. But Selena's story reminded me of something I heard out of the state of Pennsylvania earlier in the year. Another mysterious crying baby. Drug police are investigating something weird going on on the south side. Several women have reported hearing something that sounds like a baby crying, maybe a child yelling. But when police get there... There's no child to be found. Royce Jones is live now with a look at what's going on. Royce. Well, Ken, when you hear somebody outside calling in distress, your first instinct might be to go outside and check it out. But police here in the South Side are telling people who live here, if you hear this, stay inside and call 911. Just so sick and twisted, but what are you gonna do? Some people just are really messed up. Pittsburgh police tell KDKA they're investigating multiple reports from people on the south side who say they hear what appears to be odd recordings of creepy noises like babies crying and kids calling for help outside their homes. So you're not a good person to do this to college girls, young girls. So There have been four reports so far. Police responded each time, but when they arrived, no babies and nobody in distress. These college sorority sisters say they heard the noises. It happened this week in the early morning hours right outside their place. This sisterhood is now on high alert. At this time, police have no lead on a suspect or a motive, but if this is indeed a spoof, This college girl has one thing to say. And whoever's doing this obviously has a sick mind and knows that, like, we are college students and we're very naive sometimes. That clip comes courtesy of KDKA, CBS News 2 out of Pittsburgh. And I truly hope it's a kid messing around and not a predator preying on others' compassion. Because in my imagination, those sounds will lead you to a darkened alley where an ambush no doubt awaits. So there you go, Selena. It's probably a good thing you didn't go out. Of course, not investigating something like this also has the potential for tragedy. Good luck with that catch-22. And thanks again, Selena, for taking the time to call it in. Now real quick before we trudge on. If it's more content you desire, consider following our social media accounts 
Sarah John, Warren, Tony, Josh, and of course, the crypto den mom herself, Addie Lloyd, has carved out a fun, safe environment to extend your involvement in the MAU universe. So search us out on Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, or Facebook today. Okay, enough hawking and selling. Let's get back to the program. Our next entry takes me back to my home state of Ohio. Please welcome Sherry to the program. Hi Derek, this is Sherry from Cleveland. I've called before with other stories, but my daughter asked me why I hadn't shared my best ones. I have had quite a few paranormal experiences, but this is my very best one. It was a summer of record-breaking heat in 1983, and my husband and I were living in a crummy little house with no air conditioning in Charleston, West Virginia. One particularly hot night, it was impossible to sleep, and I was getting annoyed because I had to get up early for work the next day, and I was laying in bed, flopping from my back to my stomach and back again, angrily looking at the clock and thinking, oh great, now I'm only gonna get four hours of sleep. And then, oh great, now I'm only gonna get three hours of sleep. One of the times that I flopped from my stomach to my back, there she was, a woman standing over me, very close to my face, kind of studying me. She was very slightly built and fair, and she was dressed all in white. I screamed and my husband turned on the lights and asked me what was wrong. I was truly frightened, and he could see it. He's normally kind of a no-nonsense guy who would usually have said, calm down, it was a nightmare, go, go try to sleep. But he could see how shaken I was, and he believed that something weird had happened. He sat up with me with the lights on and we watched sitcoms from the 50s and eventually I felt a little better. And so I said, it's almost time to get up. Let's just try to get some sleep. Something I hadn't mentioned yet. We had a house guest. She looked nothing like the woman who had been standing over me, but she was sleeping in the next room. And the minute we turned off the light, we heard her screaming, get out, get out, go away. My heart stopped and I begged my husband to go see what was wrong. I was frozen with fear. Our friend was very disoriented and was talking about a lady she'd seen, but it was like she'd been talking in her sleep and didn't even remember any of it the next day. Fast forward a decade and we'd moved away from West Virginia and started a family. We had a daughter, Lauren, who you know, Derek, as a matter of fact, and this story became her favorite ghost story when she was a little girl. When her friends would come over and have a sleepover and tell them scary stories, I would tell this story. I must have told it a thousand times. When Lauren was in college, we were with one of her old friends, Ginger, from high school, who asked me to tell the story. After I did, Ginger said, what did she look like? And I, th I said, oh my gosh, Ginger, I can remember it was like it was yesterday. She looked like, and I stopped and gasped. All of a sudden, I realized the woman was Lauren. I didn't see it until Lauren grew up, but it was my daughter at age 20 or so. I couldn't see it until she grew up. If you've ever read anything that psychic Sylvia Brown wrote, you might remember that she used to say that our spirit selves look like we were, uh, what we look like at, at about that age. Like when you see a ghost, it's usually somebody that looks around what they did when they were 20 years old. Oh, and the weirdest thing of all, that night in 1983, Lauren was born almost nine months after the woman appeared to me. My daughter, that is. My daughter came to me before she was born, and nobody can tell me any different. Thanks for your podcast, Derek. When Monsters Among Us is in between seasons, I am really lost. I love it. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Sherry. And thanks, Lauren, for suggesting the submission. That was a fun one. I actually did some digging, expecting to find some info on this sort of phenomenon. Either no one has assigned a name to this sort of thing, or I wasn't using the correct search terms, because I came up dry. So again, I call out to you, dear listener. I know someone out there can help Sherry and Lauren get to the bottom of this odd yet somehow touching tale. But until we get those answers... Thanks again, Sherry, for sharing. And here we are, folks. The finish line. And to close this thing out, we venture to the state of New York. Nick, the mic is yours. 
Hi, Derek. It's Nick from Long Island, New York. This experience, it took me a long time to share it, and I really haven't told anyone uh, anyone else outside of, outside of the family there. About 2003, I was well, around 11, 12 years old, depending on the month. Anyway, I used to go through my uh, mother's photo albums a lot before the days of our cell phones having every picture of us. And uh, so I used to go through uh, the photo albums and then she would join me, my mother. And I remember one instance, I stumbled upon my Aunt Leslie and my Uncle Chris's wedding picture. This was a picture taken after the ceremony at the church. Here's my Aunt Leslie and my Uncle Chris, you know, wedding dress, tuxedo, taking this uh, lovely picture in front of an old fashioned style uh, cabinet with, with glass doors. So the glass doors being the backdrop. And I noticed in, in the image, there was a sort of um, a blurry blob, or so, some sort of blurry figure, okay, in, in the reflection in the, in the glass door behind them, behind my uh, aunt and uncle. And I assumed uh, at the time that it was my father's reflection because he was the one who actually took the picture. About six months later, we're all over my aunt's house visiting her uh, for the summer. And I noticed they had the same wedding picture in their house on a little desk in a picture frame. But out of curiosity, I picked it up and I was looking at it again. And this uh, copy of the picture, I don't know if this was like the original or, or something, but this copy of the picture had much more detail. It was better quality. Uh, there was no blur, there was no glare or anything. And I looked again in the reflection, the door behind them, and it was certainly not my dad. Uh, th this this figure, this reflection in, in, in the glass door behind them was uh, was humanoid, but not a not a human. Frankly, it's a very non-judgmental audience for the podcast, so uh, you know I, I am becoming more comfortable with uh, with sharing. The only thing I could describe this creature, this thing, as is the demonic. Okay, perhaps for non-religious people, they might consider it an interdimensional being or what have you. I I don't know. I'm open to it. But what I describe this creature as, a humanoid figure, you know, a torso, arms, neck, head, but the head being that of an insect, okay? The head being that of like a praying mantis type of thing. The other two details that I was always afraid of being sort of laughed at for including, but it is what it is, it looked like it had a goatee, okay? A praying mantis face with, with, with a goatee, and the final detail of it that really painted the whole thing as ominous for me, it was wearing uh, a cape, frankly. Everyone is familiar with the Bela Lugosi sort of classic cape with the big collar. That is what this creature had. Like a regal, you know, dark something. But if, if you told me that was, you know, Lucifer or, or some uh, some sort of demon king or that's what I, I would picture okay that's the only thing I, c I could describe it as I showed my mother I showed my my older brother and they were equally freaked out my brother a uh, skeptical type of guy uh, and doesn't like to admit when he's scared he tried to explain it away he tried to say that it was some sort of reflection this that and the other but it just wasn't, you know, it just wasn't. It's a very clear image, you know, the, the uh, humanoid demonic figure. My mother was uh, very upset by the picture, though, and we, none of us spoke about it, okay? None of us spoke about it going forward. We didn't even tell my aunt. We just hoped that she never noticed, you know, this is her wedding photo. Uh, oddly enough, their, their, their marriage, uh, unfortunately, did end in divorce many years later. Your mind runs wild, you know, was the marriage cursed and doomed? <laughs> from the beginning of this type of thing. I, I don't know. Long story short, if that was a, a you know, a ghost, a human spirit in, in that reflection instead, I'd be completely at peace with that. But this was not a human shape or, or form. It's always bothered me. I think about it quite often. I've had girlfriends I've never told this to and, and, and close friends and this type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never told really anyone. The podcast, though, is is so great. It's It's somewhat... You know, even therapeutic, it's good to be able to share these bizarre, unexplainable events with such a non-judgmental audience, essentially. So that's the story. Keep up the excellent content. Thanks, Derek. Okay, sorry, Nick, but I'm going to judge you. How are you going to call that in without sending me a copy of the picture? Shoot me an email, Nick. I'd even take a peek at the blurry version if that's all you have access to. 
And if you don't mind, please include permission for me to share with the rest of the listeners. As crazy as Nick's claims sound, they might not be far from the truth. As you may recall, we've discussed several Mantis Man encounters on the show in the past. The television series Monsters and Mysteries in America also featured the Mantis Man on their Season 3, Episode 8 program. Here's an excerpt from that program, a story from one of the witnesses to that creature. Now, this encounter took place only an hour from New York City, roughly the area of Nick's encounter. New Jersey gets a bad rap. This is actually a very beautiful area. A lot of parks, a lot of rivers, a lot of lakes. I've been fishing all my life. My father was a fisherman, so I started around three or four. So this particular day, my boss said, why don't we try going to the Muskinacon? I had never been there before. It was a creepy place. It's not completely in the wilderness, but when you're in the river, very often you're in a tunnel almost because of all the brush and the you know, branches. When we entered the river, my boss asked me, which way do you want to go? So I started moving, wading across the river and down. That's when I saw the movement. When I first saw the creature, I was like, what, what the heck is that? This thing had the skin of a snake. Where our abdomen is and where all our organs are, it had a very narrow core. The creature's eyes were black, very large, but set in the front, so it had binocular vision. This thing seemed to be very concerned with me. It was very aware that I was aware of it, and that seemed to concern it because it never took its eyes off of me. It was moving up the bank away from me, but looking back over its left shoulder directly at me. This thing was fading very quickly as it moved up the bank, and all that time never took its eyes off of me. It was one two, three, gone. And as if that wasn't wild enough, another witness also came back with a similar story from that same area. Be sure to check out tonight's show notes to get the rest of that story. And of course, I've received other reports, not necessarily from that region, but reports such as this one from an anonymous source in the state of Illinois. So I had an experience a handful of years ago. I was out running very early in the morning, usually at a time when there wasn't too many people or cars out. And this was in southern Illinois, and there were cornfields nearby and wooded areas, but this was a neighborhood. My dog ran with me, and this particular morning, I noticed that my dog had kind of slowed her step and was perking up and lifting her ears and looking at something that was, I guess, ahead of us. And I decided to look up and see, you know, is it a rabbit or somebody out walking, perhaps. And I saw something that initially I thought had to have been somebody wearing some kind of a costume. It was walking adjacent to a streetlight. And the streetlights, when I went back later to kind of gauge and see if maybe my perception was off, I think that the streetlight was probably between 15 and 20 feet high. And what I saw was just a few feet across the way from the streetlight, and it was nearly as tall as the streetlight. So I'm guessing it was anywhere between 10 and 15 feet tall. It was a dark, solid creature. It was walking upright, and at first I thought it was possibly somebody using stilts on their legs and carrying some kind of extenders on their arms. And I realized that somebody can't walk with stilts and bend at stilt knees. There just would be completely impossible. So I stopped where I was and watched what I was seeing. It was just walking down the road. Uh, and I was trying to discern what I might be seeing or a distortion of something. And I realized it was a real and solid creature living. As it walked, its legs lifted up and would reach and stretch in very, very long strides. It was long, dark, and skinny uh, with pointed, I guess, hands and a somewhat rectangular shape head. 
as it moved, the head seemed to sweep its gaze from side to side. As it was striding, its arms were moving in a pumping motion uh, up above its head. And I kept thinking to myself, grasshopper, this is what its body seems to resemble and be shaped like. For a moment, I thought about turning around and fleeing for home, but I felt a compulsion almost to want to know what I was seeing. So I very slowly began to jog forward towards where the creature was. It was on a road that came to a T. It was moving to the right, and I kept my eyes on it, and my dog was watching it also. And as we got closer and closer, of course, it was continuing to stride farther away. And by the time I came to the end of where the road had a T, uh, it had moved so far into the darkness that I couldn't see it at all. It had completely, I won't say vanished, but moved far enough into the darkness away from where the streetlight was and toward a wooded area that I could no longer see it. So I turned the opposite direction. I didn't have any intention of following it into the darkness. When I later gave it some thoughts, trying to come to a conclusion of what I had possibly seen, the first thing is I know it was real and solid. My dog was what brought my attention to it, so I know I wasn't hallucinating. There was no people, no cars, no one else around. Also, in putting a description to it, I would definitely have to say it was more praying mantis-like than grasshopper. Initially, I thought grasshopper because of the jointed legs and the pointy tips of the appendages and appearing to be kind of exoskeleton. I've never really been a big believer in aliens. I've never even understood or known about uh, cryptids. This was an experience that has kind of caused me to be obsessed with learning about and hopefully hearing about other people having witnessed similar things. Thank you so much for the podcast and thank you for listening to my story. That call never gets old. If you'd like to hear it in its entirety, hit up Season 3, Episode 1 of the show at MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com. Well, I don't know what these things are. Alien, military, interdimensional, or simply a cryptid. Whatever they are, I'm downright fascinated. So thanks again, Nick, for sharing. And don't forget to send me that photo. And before I go, speaking of submitting photos, you may recall on Season 9, Episode 18, we heard from Moose in Wyoming who claimed to have seen a large Sasquatch while he was on horseback. Well, Moose promised us a drawing of the Sasquatch-like creature, and he delivered. Check out tonight's show notes or look for the image on our social media accounts. Moose is a talented artist, so it's a fun image to finally lay eyes on. Thanks, Moose, for sending that in. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Addie Lloyd and Sarah Carter Hayes. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. The terrifying score you hear is Co.ag Music and White Bat Audio. Thank you so much for listening, and until next week.
Tonight's bonus entry hails from the Hoosier State. Please welcome Kenny from Indiana to the program. Hello, my name is Kenny Silcox. This happened a few years back, me and my brother. But I know right where he was, and we did see a Bigfoot. He shot it three or four times. It hung down for the last shot, and it's hanging there just looking at him. I wasn't with him. I'd been, been hunting and came back in. And then I heard him firing. He come running and told me all about it. Anyway, he shot it four times, so he shoot the big time in the face, and the gun jammed. He couldn't get the bullet in the chamber fast enough. And that Bigfoot was hanging there looking at him. By that time, my brother just freaked out and turned around and ran all the way back to that cabin. When he got there, it looked like he was having a heart attack. He told me the whole story like I'm telling you. And my, my, him and my other brother had been back there the day before, and they saw footprints everywhere. And I'm talking about this is a big wood in Indiana. It's got caves and everything. And they were talking to each other about all these little footprints. It looks like there have been a bunch of kids back there. But this is way back in there, and there's no houses, so they didn't understand that either. You know, the next day, I went and shot some squirrels. And then when I come out, my brother went back to the saw. Oh, he's going to show me, and he's going to get more squirrels. He's going to smack you into Bigfoot. And then after it was all over, we talked about it, and my third brother got home. You know, that's what the footprints was all about. And it wasn't little kids for the prints. It was a family of Bigfoot back there. And it's considered one of the oldest woods in Indiana. I'm not going to give you the exact area, but I promise you, it's 100%. I could take you to a Bigfoot. You know, he may be dead when he shot, because he shot at one eyes. But it was only buff shot, and it was a great big Bigfoot from what he carried on. And he won't go back. He's terrified. But I know, I mean, I mean I'll go. I'll take you right to the woods, right exactly where he was, the area he was in. You know, we should go in there like these other guys set up, going in the dark, or we going in the daylight. It was broad daylight when he saw it. Like I said, it was up in a tree eating hickory nuts. And just bending the limbs back, crock, crock. And he said it was bending the top of the way up the top of it, bending them back. He thought he had squirrels, so he heard it crunching. You know, like, you know, way too loud and hard. He looked up, and he seen the arm of it pulling the limb back, and just crunching, and big nuts falling. And after he realized what it was, he throws on it and picked a gun on it, because he didn't know for sure what it was. And he had to let go of the limb and look back at him. He said then he knew what it was. He said when it came down the tree, it didn't, you know, bounce, swing down like a monkey would or something. It came down just like a human would. He watched every, put his foot on every mark, had a little limb coming all the way around. He tried to get around on each side to stay away from him, though. But every time he had to circle back around to make sure it come down from getting hurt, he would fire one in and pound to the back or wherever. And nevertheless, this happened. True story. Thanks, Kenny. Now, this is not the first I've heard someone claim they've shot the big guy. I can think of a few well-known claims out of states like Oklahoma, Texas, and California. But thus far, none have produced even a shred of evidence. So, could Kenny's brother's experience be different? Could this be the incident that helps prove Bigfoot is real? Now, due to the current pandemic, I can't get out to Indiana at this time, but I'd love it. If Kenny took a trip back out there in search of a body, bones, or at least a piece of fur. And Kenny, if you do find something, let me know and I'll see what I can do about getting it DNA tested. Now if this story are true and genuine, the ramifications are monumental. But let me know what you find, Kenny. And be sure to have a camera rolling when you find it. Thanks again for the submission, and thank you for sticking around to the end of the program. Have a great night.